1771, the French artist Jean-Honoré Fragonard painted a series of four panels for the mistress of the King of France, Madame de Berry. The paintings are entitled The Progress of Love, and they follow a loose sequence of events in the courtship of two young lovers. The first panel shows the young man leaping out, as it were, from behind a bush, proffering a rose to the object of his affections, a young lady. Surprised with her companions, she glances at him, but appears to be running from him. Up above is a statue of two cupids looking on playfully, delighted with all the fun and mischief that is to come. Once, when I was a very small boy, I remember we made Valentine cards out of potato prints, and I still remember the sense of mystery and excitement that ran around the classroom, the giggling and the nudging, the sense that something big was going down and we didn't quite know what it was. And today, decades later, after all the ins and outs of dating, courtship, marriage and fatherhood, I still feel as though romantic love is a, a complete mystery to me. I'm an artist myself and, and lately I've been thinking quite a bit about Fragonard's paintings, The Progress of Love, not only because they're very beautiful paintings but also the idea, the notion that love is a series of inbuilt, hardwired behaviours over which perhaps we have little control. And I wonder why it has to be the shape that it is. I wonder why the delusions that so often go with love, why the heartache, the jealousies, the sleepless nights, uh, the divorces, the reconciliations, why the reams of love letters. And I thought, well, maybe at this somewhat later stage of my life, I can once again be allowed to ask some of the absurdly big questions, or in this case, one question. What is romantic love, and why does it have to be the way that it is? I had an Ernie doll when I was little, like Bert and Ernie, Ernie from Sesame Street, and I had to go with him everywhere. You know, um, I'm sorry, he had to go with me everywhere. Okay. <laughs> and. Uh, I loved him, you know, he was my security. Mm. And um, I had gotten a lot of, uh, in, um, I had gotten sick because I kept sucking my thumb, you know, and I would only do it when he was around, I don't know mm -hmm. why. But uh, my sister thought that that was a problem and I was getting older, so mm. she hid him from me. And I was devastated. Mm. I mean, you know, he wasn't there, my security was gone, you know, mm. my friend was gone and I was completely devastated. <clears throat> and um, so she hit him for my benefit. But yeah, he was, Ernie was my first love, <laughs> as, as far as I can remember. He was there, he was my friend. Yeah. And yeah. it's funny because Bert and Ernie came in a set and yeah. nobody liked Bert. Bert was this angry, negative guy and Ernie was always like the, hey Bert, let's go do something. And you're like, yeah, let's go do something. He was fun, mm -hmm. he had a personality, you know, yeah. And uh, so I grew attached to him. The first love, real love, I ever felt was so innocent. And that feeling was just as strong as all the loves that I had later on. I remember just holding mm. someone's hand, mm. feeling that connection. You know, I look at the guy that I could have married, mm -hmm. and you know, we lived in the same neighbor, na town, went to the same church, went to the same school, we knew each other for years, and then we ended up meeting in high school and being together for seven, nine years, but he wasn't the one. I knew that we ended up being more like brother and sister, and then it went on. But look at Monty and I, look at where different places we came from. And he all of a sudden ends up in my class. So that's fate, right? 
Well, I don't know if it's fate, but it was just sort of it was just sort of weird because I was I was with someone else at the time, and but I was having I was I was having like these little talks to myself, saying I kind of really really like this guy. He's a really nice person, mm. you know. There's something about him, and we kind of laugh a lot together. But now, 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 mm. you know. Well, uh, Japanese people's romance is more like a unsaid, unuttered. More, we feel each other, and uh, you don't have to say I love you, or that kind of word is not, doesn't mean much to Japanese people's romance. For example, my uh, friend, when uh, they met, they, they have been married for 20 years, maybe. And then I asked her how, how he proposed her. <laughs> he said, what proposal? <laughs> uh, he, he never said, I love you. <laughs> he never proposed me officially. But how, how, how did you know you are in uh, you know, romance and start to get together and marry finally? But just we know, we knew. From forth the fatal loins of these two foes, a pair of star-crossed lovers take their life. My ears have not yet drunk a hundred words of thy tongue's uttering, yet I know the sound. Art thou not Romeo and a Montague? The media, I mean, everybody has all kinds of definitions of, of romantic love, but my just initial take on romantic love is that it involves passion. It involves a sense of, of ecstasy, of, woohoo, this is fabulous, I'm on cloud nine, I never want to get off. Um, I want this to be forever. And so there is, going back to that holistic approach that I have with people, if a person comes in, in that state of romantic love, I meet them where they're at and work with them, knowing that that kind of intense emotion and passion will be with them probably for a while. And it will probably subside because the, the human body cannot sustain that level of intensity and passion for a very, very long time. Um, oh, the person will just get totally worn out and flip out. <laughs> It is not the strongest of the species that survives, nor the most intelligent that survives. It is the one that is most adaptable to change. There are a lot of theories about sexual reproduction, uh, as opposed to asexual reproduction. And sexual reproduction entails a considerable cost, unlike asexual reproduction where you pass on all your genes. Mm. So in effect, sexual reproduction means that you compromise your genetic representation in subsequent generations by only passing on a random sample of half of your genes every time you reproduce. Mm. And in order for that to occur, there have to be some embedded compensating benefits. And there are all kinds of ideas and theories about what those benefits may have been and continue to be. I don't know that I ever felt that fate was moving me, you know, against... I'm trying to think of the right word for this, but I would feel at times with someone early on that I could get a flash of the future and in all the major relationships that I had early on I would just see a flash of the future and, um, and a flash of possible futures and I, I always felt them as, as possible futures because I think I am a believer in, in choice you know and, and in how we create things um, so I I think that you know. I, I think that what, once we've made certain decisions, it can feel like fate. But I, I suppose I really believe in choice, 
And I think that you, you help create the person that you're going to be by the person you're with. So in a sense, you're not just giving birth to a future, you're giving birth to the you that is going to emerge because we're different people with the different people you know, that we're with. days away from turning 14. Um, it's a dangerous age. It is dangerous. Yeah, yeah. Um, there was a guy, because I had just, yeah, I had just moved mm -hmm. to this other, like, kind of townhouse-y complex. Mm -hmm. And I guess um, this guy that would come around, like, hang out with the other kids, he, mm -hmm. uh, we started hanging out this mm -hmm. one night. My sisters um, were up from college, so they mm -hmm. knew his brother and their friends, and so my sister's like, I think, you know, you should meet this kid. And I was like, okay, and I'm like, whatever. You know, and kind of just that carefree attitude, because it's like, I'm not looking too much into it, because I'm thinking this guy's not gonna like me anyway. So then we start, you know, hanging out and talking, and, you know, we become girl, uh, girlfriend and boyfriend. And I was very excited, but at the same time, like, I didn't really like him, <laughs> to be mm. honest. I didn't really like him. Um, I mean, he was, uh, I think he was 16 at the time, so he was a little bit older than me, mm. and I was just stepping into a new high school, uh, being new, coming from kind of a, a bad neighborhood, bad friends, bad everything. I wanted to make a fresh start in the right place. And I think my jumping off point, thank goodness, that only lasted a couple of months because I found out that, because I wouldn't do anything with them, you know, bottom line. You were 14. Yeah, I was 14, exactly. That's yeah. bottom line. Yeah. Um, come to find out that he, um, I guess, made out with somebody at some, behind the AMP. <laughs> So there you go. This is this is the stuff I had to deal with. So I was just like, good. And I'm thinking to myself, you know what? It's okay because I always believed in my heart being a very little girl, watching the movies and watching TV, though it might be as stupid as it sounds, I always believed that there was going to be somebody out there for me, one person. And I, you know, never stopped searching until the day I stopped searching that will be the day that that person comes into my life. So at that point, knowing the information that I had found out about him, that it didn't crush me completely. I knew I was going to a new school, I was gonna find someone else, and I didn't really like him at anyway. But, um, but yeah. I had wonderful friends growing up. My teenage years were the best, and we were always very honest with each other, but we did have a lot of fun. There was a lot of laughter, a lot of talking, and uh, the advantage of being raised in the city, there were many boys and girls always together, and there was no sexuality. I mean, it wasn't acceptable then, but we didn't even, we weren't, because it wasn't acceptable, we had the time for friendships, and the friendships grew, and we were all pretty bright, but the caring was there. We were concerned about one another. <laughs> I had a lot of uh, pictures from a uh, proper gentleman, and all that. but I, I never went to, uh, it's called Omiyai, check it out each other <laughs> meeting a tradition like that we wear kimonos and go to a fancy restaurant and uh, go between person and introduce each other and my parents are married that way too but i never went to that kind of meeting i, I was kind of a rebel nowadays that's kind of a uh, just like a match match dot com type of a Thing. Yeah. Just uh, giving them the opportunity to meet each other, and if it's you know work, then 
that's fine, but otherwise you don't have to do it. So you have this brief, passionate connection with someone, and you're saying it's not as all-encompassing as the lasting relationship. And I don't know if that's always true. I don't know if, you know, you have paintings here of, of, of childhood and riding your bike, and you know how those moments when you're young can, can have a kind of visceral quality that day-to-day -day life, with all of its mundane tasks and duties, may not have. We must, however, acknowledge, as it seems to me, that man, with all his noble qualities, still bears in his bodily frame the indelible stamp of his lowly origin. So you have a process where life itself is a self-replicating chemical reaction. That's the defining property of life. So life is defined as something that just keeps reproducing. By reproduction. That's the game. This chemical reaction adheres to itself other processes with time and, and becomes more complex. Correct. And it becomes life. Okay. Well, life is. That, that's all life uh, is. Yeah. It, reproduction. Okay. That's, I mean, there are some people that have argued that reproduction is more important than life itself. Mm -hmm. Because there wouldn't be any life without reproduction. If reproduction stopped, mm. life would go extinct. There's a whole uh, marriage therapy that's based on that, a couples therapy, actually. Harville Hendricks, have you heard of him? No. Um, he has what he calls imago therapy, and his belief is that uh, we all come from families, whatever kind of family that is, Every family in some way is not completely functional. And the kind of love that we experience is imprinted on us at a very young age. And so we seek what's familiar. And what's familiar is what we grew up with. And if we're not more enlightened about the whole being in love process, then we are going to fit hand in glove and connect with what's familiar. A perfect example of this is... Um, children from alcoholic families, where either one or both parents are alcoholics, will gravitate towards a, a person, a man or a woman, who manifests those familiar behaviors, destructive though they might be, because it's familiar and there is, it, it feels right. The second panel shows what appears to be an illicit meeting between the lovers. The young man clambers up a ladder and over a parapet to gain access to his young lady. She looks away from him as she does in all the panels except the first. Up above is another statue, this time showing a standing nude woman, a Venus of some kind, and next to her a young Cupid who is pestering her and trying to get her attention. When I was 18, um, I was with a guy that was six years older than me, and uh, you think that because he's older, he would know how to treat a lady, but he unfortunately did not know how. So, so you were 18, he was 24. Which is like, what are you doing there? But again, you know, he was funny, and he was so promising with all of these, you know, gestures that I'm sorry, you get confused and you believe that this is love and you want it to be love. And it is not. It is not. Tell me about the gestures. What kinds of gestures did you find interesting? Or, or did you find that drew you in? Or you were he, would, by? he would take his time to show me his feelings. He would tell me his feelings. I was important in his life. You know, um... Then, let's fast forward, um, then it was like, it's your birthday oh, already? You know, like, oh, oh, really? Like, I, I felt like I was doing both. I was, I was the girlfriend and I was the boyfriend. And in my mind, I was doing the best I could, but this was almost like I was dating a child. And I would say, hey, 
this is not what I want. I want love. I want passion. I want to be kissed in the rain. And I would get laughed at in my face. And my, my, the response was, uh, you know, um, but it's wet outside. So this is what I had to deal with. So this is, this is where the love either, see love is very powerful. Either love will set you on high and you will be up in the clouds for days because it's so awesome. And everything is aligned. Everything is fabulous. Nothing could possibly go wrong. And then love, on the other hand, it could just rip your heart right out of your own ass. Uh, when I was engaged to Jack, I was, I left college and I went to the Stenotype Institute and I was given a job after three months, a Society of Motion Picture and Television Engineers. And the man who I was hired for, I was hired as a secretary and he was, it had been in California and I was hired before he arrived. He was getting a divorce and when I first looked at him, I thought, he's, he looked like Howdy Doody to me. I thought he was the, one of the homeliest men I've ever seen. Not that I felt this in a disparaging way, I was just astounded. And working with that man was so wonderful. But my pa I was engaged at the time, and my parents felt that I was falling in love with him. Because they said, all you do is talk about Bill Dacey. And um, he was smart, he was adorable, he was great company, and I learned so much from him. And I, we did a great job together. And we, there were many reports that were out, and we had to go to the Biltmore Hotel often because people from California was, were coming in for dinner. We, and I would arrange some of the luncheons and take the minutes. And, but he, I was very, very happy with him. And um, it was so interesting because now that I look back, I was falling in love with him. I respected him tremendously. There was nothing petty about him. And we laughed so during the day. I, perhaps it was the laughter. But his, his wife decided against the divorce. She came to New York. He came to my wedding and his wife said to me, I am so glad that you are getting married. You know, you, you certainly stay up late. You, you definitely are up very late. It's like you don't have a sleep mechanism. You know, you just don't want to go to sleep. You're up dancing. Yeah. And I remember Monty and I jumping around this living room <laughs> two o'clock in the morning. <laughs> yeah. Doing African dancing, you yeah. know. Yeah. It's exhausting being in love, right? Well, apparently, not at the time. It's actually, you feel quite, quite good, I think. I don't know, <laughs> now, if I had to go through that now, I, I actually, I have <laughs> said to somebody, uh, you know, I've actually said, you know, I'm glad I don't have to go through that shit because it is, it is exhausting on the other thing. You, all of a sudden, you, you've got this thing where you need to be with that, you just can't settle down. It's like, you know, you're like a kid that needs to, you know, when you tell your kid, sit down, you just stop wiggling and sit down. That's sort of how you feel inside, you know, you can't quite settle down. You feel insatiable in, in a way. And uh, it's so nice to not have to feel that way. I'd say that was, that was exhausting. You know, I could just be me. Come night, come Romeo, come thou day in night. For thou wilt lie upon the wings of night whiter than new snow upon a raven's back. Come gentle night, come loving black-browed night, give me my Romeo. And when I shall die, Take him and cut him out in little stars, and he will make the face of heaven so fine that all the world will be in love with night and pay no worship to the garish sun. Even we don't have a, a, the language, the words for I love you. We, we the, as much as, as I can say is I like you. <laughs> Skides means I like you. 
I stay must is a, I love you, but we don't say it. It may be in the written language, your love letter, and those things, but we don't say that. If you say, I stay must means really <laughs> not comfortable words for Japanese to say. So I like you. I, Mm. I like you very much. Let the allies talk. <laughs> mm. But one of the things that happens in human mating relationships early in life is that people fall in love. Right. So they 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 get to the state where they go nuts. Correct. And their judgment is, to say the least, often compromised. Yeah. So against all this careful mathematics of genetics, nature seems to provide this shot of craziness that will make reproduction almost happen anyway. So what's all that about? Is that just insurance? If you don't like the person, you're going to make out with them anyway? We've done some research yeah. that, that bears on this mm -hmm. issue. Some, it's some research both on, on kissing behavior and some research on semen chemistry. We did a large uh, survey on this campus involving well over a thousand students a number of years ago in which we asked male and female undergraduates targeted, using anonymous surveys, targeted questions about kissing behavior and their experience with kissing. And one of the things we discovered was that the majority of both males and females have on one or more occasions found themselves attracted to a member of the opposite sex only to discover after they kiss them for the first time that they're no longer interested. So that first kiss can be a make or break proposition with regard to the future status of the relationship. And I suspect that at the moment of kiss there's a very complicated exchange of information involving tactile cues and postural adjustments and the means by which the couple embrace and olfactory cues, body odor, the exchange perhaps even of salivary chemicals. And all of this information may be brought to bear unconsciously on hardwired mechanisms that make a determination about the health, vitality, fertility, and genetic compatibility of that other person as a prospective mate. Is love dangerous? Yes, you know, I think it is because it, just like driving under the influence, you know, under, under a certain kind of influence, you can end up committing yourself to the wrong person or the wrong situation. Mm -hmm. And I think in part it depends on how, how invested you are with having the whole package come together. You know, one of the reasons that I don't write completely, at, usually within the realm of, of, of genre romances, there's often a package that, that you're supposed to, the person in these, you know, heterosexual romances, the person who you match up with is going to be the father of your children. And in fact, the ultimate sort of climax, shall we say, of the book is often, you know, I'm pregnant or I have a baby. And I feel that life is more complicated than that. And very often, you know, children complicate romance. You've got, you know, all that real world stuff, which I like to tip my hat to. So I, I think mm -hmm. the idea that the very person who could be the ideal, you know, genetic father of your children may not be the grand romance. Or if so, there might be complications. I don't think love is a destructive force. I think romantic love could be a destructive force. But even that, I wouldn't say. Um, there are 
gods in the Hindu religion, the god of life is also the god of death. So they're connected, life and death. And if there is going to be some sort of destruction, I always see that it's the prelude to the emergence of new life. As far as men and women go, it's like, you know, um, it's who's going to be the most compatible with that other person. You know, men, uh, women tend to be more nurturing. That's in our nature, you know, to be more mother-like. So, you know, you have a guy that might be a little too needy, like, you know, what does he want? Does he want a mother or does he want a girlfriend? You know, or does this guy just want to, you know, do it and go? Or does he want to stay around? So you don't know what, but what I think is the essential part is that you really got to get to know the person that you want to be with. You got to take everything slow because when you don't and it becomes more physical and you, you attach emotions to more physical stuff and that's where it goes awry because you just have it leading like if you're set up on some blind date and you're forced to talk to each other, it's more of like this forced kind of thing. Mm -hmm. It's not this natural organic Mm -hmm. you know, unfolding of, of oneself. Mm -hmm. And I think that it can be extremely confusing to your mind because your mind will tell you one thing and your heart will believe another. You got married at the age of 19. 19. So you were in love. I was in love with Jack Martyr, yeah. but the man I married had lost his mother three weeks before the marriage. And it was, now I realize, well, I felt the wedding should have been called off, but my parents and I was still my, that my parents' daughter, my parents felt that it was bad luck. Well, yes, perhaps. But um, it could have been a very quiet ceremony instead of this party. And Jack was very devoted to his mother. And um, it was sad. He was really in deep mourning. And when we moved to DC immediately, he had a job in Washington. Uh, he went to Georgetown for his master's and threw himself into that. And um, he, he, I, he wasn't the person I knew because of what he was going through. And it continued to bother him. His father remarried quickly after his mother died. She had been a chronic invalid. And um, Jack would get panic attacks. We didn't know what they were at the time. But uh, I felt very rejected by him. But I knew, I knew he loved me. I knew he was trying his best, but I didn't understand I was, what was happening. That's how he gave me the engagement ring, in a, um, in a James Way bag. You know, it was the James Way bag because he had, he had got, he would always drop, I think it was James Way or one of those places, he would drop by and get a couple of CDs I talk about, and he still does that, and he'd say, I got you a little something. Um, and uh, so in that thing, I was talking about, you know, you know, we're engaged here, you know, maybe we should get engaged for me. I said, you know, you don't have to go buy a big crazy, I just give me one of them big, those cubic zirconia things, you could do that. So that night he came in with a James Way bag, you know, and there was a, a, a box in there. He says, there's something else in there. And I opened it up and my father was having pizza that night and he's waiting, come on, let's get this going on. So I opened up the box and this ring was in it and it's three diamonds. And they're, these are that um, old mine cut. So they've got this like sparkly, colorful thing. So it was looking, look like, it almost looked like one of those old mirror rings, you know, those colorful pink, you know, and mm -hmm. it had so much color on it. And three diamonds, I mean, Monty's not a three diamond dude. You know, he's just not a three diamond mm -hmm. dude. So I'm thinking, I said, okay, where'd you get it? 
you know, you get this, huh? I said, oh, you went big. You went big in James Way with the with the cubic zirconia. You mm -hmm. went really big. And then I put it on my finger and it fit absolutely perfectly. Mm -hmm. And I could feel, feel the weight, yeah. you know? And I said, this isn't real, is it? Come on. I really mm -hmm. thought he was pulling my leg. When we married, my husband and I, mm -hmm. in Portland, Oregon, mm -hmm. we were married in the court. Okay. <laughs> And uh, that was 70s, so you, you can guess. And West Coast. <laughs> yeah, a bunch of hippies, right? A bunch yeah, of yeah. hippies, flower, flower girl type. Yeah, yeah. We married in a court, and mm. uh, we didn't have any you know, ring or anything either. Yeah. And mm. the judge, who was a big Italian guy, and he couldn't go through without ring exchange and everything. So he lent us the ring, his ring, and his secretary lent me the, uh, her wedding ring. Oh. Well, we have to, of course, return. Of course. Yeah, yeah. how sweet of them. Mm -hmm. Some people myself included, buy into the idea that sexual reproduction evolved, among many other things, to be a genetic variability promoting device. So in effect, sexual reproduction involves a situation in which you take a random sample of two independent solutions that are now combined to find new solutions. See, asexual reproduction represents a static set of solutions. You merely clone yourself, so the existing configuration remains, genetic configuration remains the same, it remains static over time. But the likelihood then of being able to adapt to future changes is reduced Whereas with sexual reproduction, by bringing two quasi-independent solutions together, that increases the likelihood of producing new and unique combinations of genetic material. But you then also, it would seem, inevitably create two different kinds of creatures, a male and a female, and they quickly develop properties other than their reproductive properties. But to take that a step further, in the process of the development of sexual reproduction, the reproductive best interests of, a mem of the members of one sex may become very different from the reproductive best interests of the members of the opposite sex. So that then adds an additional level of complexity to the selection process. So that, so that for, for example, in the case of sexually reproducing species, particularly in the case of mammals, females have an ironclad guarantee of sharing half their genes in common with each of their kids. Males don't. Males can be cuckolded. Female infidelity, which can lead to non-paternity, becomes the weak link in the genealogical scheme of things. So that puts pressure on males to develop strategies for maximizing paternity. Marie, why does love entail being blind? Because nobody's perfect. And we have to be right. <laughs> We're looking for the perfect mate. We want the perfect person. So we project it onto some poor sod who just isn't going to be it, right? That's right. And that often is what leads to divorce. Right. When yeah. that illusion manifests itself as illusion and the person realizes the person I married isn't God, isn't going to fulfill all of my physical, emotional, mental, sexual, everything desires. My, that person is not going to do that. Now what? Yeah. And sometimes they say, well, it's your fault and therefore goodbye and I'm moving on to, I'll find Mr. Perfect or Mr. Right or Mrs. Right or Mrs. Whatever sometime down the line and I'll just keep moving on. Yeah, so you're chasing a chimera, essentially. 
Exactly, right. Fast forward to uh, a day he calls me, I'm homesick. He calls me up, I'm like, why is this guy calling me? Like, what, what, what does he want, you know? And I'm like, and he leaves a very, very nice message. And uh, so I'm like, this is so weird. I'm like, why is he calling me? So, so he's calling me about something that he's gonna be filming and wants to know if I wanna help him out. And I'm thinking to myself, you know what? I'm gonna be filming stuff soon. I'm gonna need help. And there's not many people around here that are in this industry, so let's help each other out. So wind up meeting him. Well, meet at the Millbrook Diner parking lot, and then we get into the car. And I dressed up very nice that day because we had to do this like interview thing for this website. So I guess he's never saw me like that before. <laughs> like I was dressed so nice. I was like, hey. So anyway, I'm thinking I'm meeting Zach. It's just Zach. So I get in the car. And our ride from the parking lot to our location was like, whoa, it was just like mind blowing. Like, wow, like this guy, we, we love Chicago. The second Chicago came up, forget about it. Um, ghost hunters, we just kept talking about everything. And I was just like, oh my gosh. And I'm like, wow. And just from the car ride, knowing like, this guy is a really great guy. And then after we were done filming, we hung out with him and his friend and we, we got some pizza. And it was like, after I left and went home, I was like, I want to hang out with him again. Jack's depression was uh, daily. He wasn't, um, he was very happy with his children. When Melanie was born, he was thrilled beyond belief, of course. She brought a great deal of joy to Jack and to my father-in-law, who loved the children dearly. I was very close to my father-in-law, very close to him. So that was good. We, there were some good points, but I did meet someone along the way, and um, that was a surprise. I never looked for anything, but he was... Um, well, that's another story. But he sort of opened the door to what it would be like to be with someone else. And where I mattered, I had reached a point with Jack, not that it was deliberate on his part, but I, I just didn't matter. And the children always matter to him. But you do stay with a man if you feel he's a good father because the children are your responsibility and they deserve that. But Jack had reached a point when he just wanted to be alone. Have you ever been with somebody you really don't want to be with? It Like you feel, well maybe you haven't, but it, like it seemed good? I should, I sh why, I should like this person. They're, they're certainly, they're, they're successful, they're this or they're that, and they've got all the stuff, and it's like, and you're not feeling it? And yet I wish, but for the thing I have. My bounty is as boundless as the sea, my love is deep. The more I give to thee, the more I have. For both are infinite. I was just brought up. Mm. When I was little, I was mm. brought up to become a, a wife, yeah. a bride. Mm. So the, everything is like a, a flower arrangement and tea ceremony and all the mm. basic proper uh, bride's requirements. I, mm. <laughs> I started from a young mm. uh, age, just seven years old. Those skills would allow you to keep house in a certain way, at a certain level, right? Not no, the ha to not keep, keep house. house. To entertain. Uh, mm. well, more like requirement to be a proper woman. You don't have to use that. Well, of course we use, but uh, that's not for the, uh, you know, the house decoration or anything. Like, 
So it's more like an accomplishment. Oh, well, that's yeah. right. Yeah, yeah. The refinement. Yeah. 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 But behind that is more like a compassion or peace, uh, or harmony, and those things behind it. Mm. Like philosophical. Mm. So that makes you a better person, supposed to be. <laughs> By the time a female has three children that are all sired by the same male, she will have sampled most, eight, roughly 87.5% of her male partner's genes. So any additional children sired by that male become increasingly redundant copies. And mm. The likelihood that her children are going to pass on her genes is in part going to be related to the range of genetic variability among her, among her children. The greater the range of genetic variability, the greater the chances that in the face of a dramatic environmental change, there will be some of her children who will have the mix of genes that will accommodate that change. So some, some theorists have speculated that females have a lot to gain by engaging in extra pair copulations, mm. which increases the likelihood of having children sired by males other than her committed partner, if for no other reason than to increase the range of genetic variation among her existing children. Is it possible to then go to the figures on divorce and show that women with certain numbers of children are more likely to file for divorce? There are data that show that the likelihood of female infidelity goes up after the third child. Okay. The probability of divorce does not. The probability of divorce is inversely proportional to the number of children. Once you have a good provider, you don't want to get rid of him. Precisely. But you may feel this deep drive to try out something different. And or to sample genes that are of higher quality than those of your current mate. So if you're going to be unfaithful, you're going to be unfaithful with someone of higher status. Correct. Yeah. Okay. And that fits the evidence pretty well. So the evidence is that if the woman has the affair, it's not with the plumber, it's with the doctor or lawyer or whatever? Is that... it's, it's typically with a male who is of higher phenotypic quality than her current partner, as, as expressed by his status, his income, Whatever, I mean. You had fallen in love with someone. With one of the workers there. Who was, he were... was a dental student. We bought a new house. Mm -hmm. And he um, was working there for the summer. And would, I was unpacking, and he would come and help unpack. He would be with the children. He would, you know, every morning, we were the only ones with a large dining room table, so coffee would be at my place and my neighbors would be there and it was fun again. Mm. It was fun and Jack knew this but he didn't mind it all just so long as he was left alone. Mm. He says, look, I, he had said to me that I see that something is not right with this marriage. You never, you're never with your husband or he comes home and there's no talking. He said, I think the two of you have to just go out. He said, I will come and watch the children. They knew him. So it was a Friday night. I thought that was a good idea when Jack got home. Um, Chuck was there. And he said, my gift to both of you is that I'm going to watch, be with the children. They were in bed. And you two go to the movies or whatever, go out. And... Um, if it gets too late, I'll sleep here on the couch. And Jack said he wasn't going anywhere. 
so uh, he's so Chuck said, well, but Thelma wants to go. Why don't you? It'll do you good. Walk the board, walk whatever. He said, I'm not going anywhere. If she wants to go, you take her. No, so yeah. I did. We did go out. Yeah. Wow. And it was terrible. Yeah. And, uh, and I told Jack, and I said, I'm not going to live this way. We'll have to divorce. We have two children. And we d he finally agreed. I did go for counseling, as he wanted me to do. I also saw a rabbi that he wanted me to see. How was the rabbi? He made a pass at me. <laughs> One of the wonderful things about being a therapist is that in working with other individuals, I'm constantly working with myself and trying to improve who I am so that I can be a better person and a better therapist. And so, yes, you're right. There is a, a you know, a sticky patch, if you will. And uh, people need to be loved and encouraged through that so that they don't give up, so that they seek their resources that they have within themselves. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's a process that goes on quite a while, right? I mean, maybe for the rest of their lives. That's right, exactly. I remember uh, quite a number of years ago when I was thinking about marriage, and I was in my late 30s, and I thought, I don't think anyone in their 20s should ever get married. I mean, this was a, a ridiculous thought to have, but I realized how much work I had done in my own journey psychologically, spiritually, mentally, emotionally. And to think that people in their 20s and even in their teens get married and, you know, make this commitment to each other. At, in my late 30s, I was much more aware of what the complexity, if you will, of enduring love of a marriage entails for not just me, but for the person that I'm marrying. I was thinking of how can I call him without being desperate because whatever. So, um, you know, we found ways to, to talk to each other on the phone or I text him or he texts me and it would just be this friendly like hello. And I didn't want to tell any of my friends because they already preset in their brain that, you know, that I didn't like them. So I didn't want to give in to it right away because I always made the mistake of doing that. I always made the mistake of letting everybody know my business and you know I, I i just wanted to keep it to myself and and not and make sure that it wasn't up here and make sure that it was in here because your mind can be can really f things up for you sometimes because you'll think it's love and it's not love so i wanted to take my time get to know this guy more and hang out with him. He just seems so much fun. And at the time, like, I just needed that in my life. You know, I just needed a break from my norm and hang out with someone cool. So he started coming over and, you know, we started listening to records and just and, and my neighbor would pound on the, on the wall because we were laughing so loud. And we'd be up till like five in the morning just chatting away, you know, and uh, just learning more about him. And it was like, I didn't want him to leave. And it didn't seem like he wanted to leave either. <laughs> so it was cool. It is love is blind. You know, have you ever read The Road Less Traveled? I mean, it's, there's a great explanation for about romantic love and, uh, and about it. It's like all those little things, you know, where you know, they keep a toilet seat up or the cap off the toothpaste or whatever. I mean, they walk in the light. It's like you don't see. And then all of a sudden, one day, it's like all of a sudden, all these little things start to bother you. And it's like... They never bothered me before. What happened? Is it a chemical that happened in me that's just all of a sudden, did I stop loving it? No, they say in that book, they say, that's when real love begins. That's when real love begins. That's not love. All that stuff that happened up to the point where, you know, you were just looking and that was like the most, the handsomest, the best, the smartest, the whatever person in the world. That's just 
hormones and uh, genetics and all of that playing a trick on your body to, te to get you to procreate, to mate. And then once you're actually in the relationship, you know, that's our history coming through with us, um, that's when real love comes in. So, you know, I think it's, I don't think it's as, I think it's rarer than we think, that real love thing. A woman one loves rarely suffices for all our needs, so we deceive her with another whom we do not love. My husband, not my husband, my father had a lot of extra really? marriage things. Yeah. <laughs> was, uh, you know, professional entertainer. Yeah. You know, yeah. Uh, must have those ladies for uh, after dark entertainment. Mm -hmm, so mm -hmm. I'm sure he had uh, lots of. Uh, mm -hmm. He was handsome. And he was cultured person. And yeah. Very, you know, popular. Yeah. Kind of yeah. man, but my mother once in a while she, she heard a rumor or some, she just ignored and moved on. Mm. <laughs> so, but yeah. I I was brought up in that yeah. kind of yeah. um, environment. If you yourself would not cheat, and then your partner cheats, mm. that. You know, you may not have been walking around jealous, but that's really broken the trust for you. On the other hand, I think there's a different kind of jealousy. There's the jealousy of people who would themselves cheat and therefore are more aware that it could happen yeah, from the yeah. other end. So yeah. those are sort of the two separate poles. Women risk more from infidelity than men do. Considerably more. Yeah. Now, women can't be cuckold. They can't be duped into caring for children other than their own. Males can. So the principal cost of female infidelity for males is the prospect of being duped into caring for the children of some other male. Women can't be cuckolded, but they can be abandoned. An abandonment of a woman with young dependent children in the ancestral environment would have had dire consequences. So a woman's risk in being unfaithful to a male who is providing for her in a primitive society is essentially life-threatening. There were yeah. instances in our, in our even recent historical uh, past, documented instances in which women have been killed on suspicions of infidelity. So mm. that then raises the question, mm. if the costs of infidelity are that high, not only could the woman be killed, but not uncommonly her children may perish and or be killed. Mm. The male may commit infanticide mm. as well. So yeah. in the face of those kinds of costs, how could female inf infidelity continue to exist? Well, you only pay the price to the extent that detection occurs. The imputation from that would be that women are better at deception than men. <sighs> yes and no. There, there used to be a, there used to be a popular television program. I don't know there was, whether it was broadcast in the UK as well, but in this country there used to be a popular game show 20 or 30 years ago and it was called To Tell the Truth. And you had three people, actors, who all claimed to be the same person, only one of which really was. And then you had a, a set of judges who would listen to these claims and attempt to make a determination about who was telling the truth and who wasn't. I would predict that if you were to manipulate the sex of the actors and the sex of the judges, males would make better actors and females would make better judges. 
And the reason I'd make that prediction is that when it comes to mate choice, females not only have to make very judicious mate choices when it comes to quality and phenotypic characteristics, but females have to make mate choices that put a premium on the development of a pair bond and a committed relationship that will involve provisioning of the female and her children and protection of her of, of, of her and her children by her committed partner. Which means that during human evolutionary history, during courtship, females probably attempted to postpone copulation for purposes of assessing phenotypic qualities and the willingness to enter into a committed relationship. Males, on the other hand, because they have a almost limitless capacity to reproduce and are required to make far less of a parental commitment, may have been selected to practice patterns of opportunistic rather than committed mating. And under those circumstances, males may have developed strategies involving dishonest mating, where they make disingenuous claims about commitment for purposes of trying to gain sexual favors, which would take the form of, I love you, so let's go to bed. And under those conditions, females would be selected to distinguish between disingenuous and ingenuous claims. So they would be better judges and males would be selected to be better actors. So, I mean, what you, you describe a sort of evolutionary arms race where Precisely. The, the men get better at lying, the women get better Ex at, at a, perceiving it. A woman's sixth sense. Dost thou love me? I know thou wilt say I, and I will take thy word. Yet, if thou swearest, thou mayst prove false. At lovers' perjuries, they say Jove laughs. He that is not jealous is not in love. What do you say to someone who's jealous? Do you just sit there and listen to them being jealous? Well, again, it's to look at where did that come from? Mm. What does this tie into? What's the history of this? Mm. And to understand better how this evolved and then to work with that. Mm. Because there's no one answer for any issue, including jealousy. Yeah. What kinds of things do you fight about and how do you resolve fights? Um, it honestly would be something like a miscommunication kind of thing. You know, um, because we, we're, when we met each other, we were at two different places. You know, it's like I've, I've gone through these types of guys over and over. So sometimes it might seem like I have some trust issues and I can't, and I'm always thinking something bad's going to happen. Well, and how, uh, how would that pan out? Well, it would exactly. usually like, you know, I would, I would do my crying thing that I do and I'd be like, but whatever. He'd go, Hey, are you all right? And the lady thing is, yeah, everything's fine. Are you sure? What, what's wrong? Yeah. Nothing. Nothing. We always do that. Nothing. <laughs> and there is always something wrong. And I know, you, you but you just got to dig down to find out what the heck it is. Well, usually, I mean, I don't want it to be a guessing game. It's mm. just normally. I don't know how to put my feelings into words and I'm not actually sure why I'm upset mm. about a certain thing mm. because usually if it's if it's something that's going on personally in my life and I'm confused and I don't know how to how, why why it's making me upset mm. so to lessen confusion on his part I'll just be like you know nothing but we've resolved it to you know just tell me that I I'm I'm thinking about how to say it to you so just give me some time you know, everything's okay, but I just need that time to fuse it together to make real sentences here. Mm -hmm. And then I'll present it to you and we can talk about it. But 
what's awesome about being with him and being in this relationship is that no matter what the problem is with just more more or less the communication thing um we always just find out what it is that's wrong and we just try to fix it as soon as we can and talking about it right away rather than holding it off and i feel so much comfortable talking to him about my feelings than with anyone else you know um that i've that i've been with the third panel shows the consummation of the relationship the so-called crowning of love this is a somewhat symbolic consummation with the young lady holding a crown of flowers above the lover's head. Again, she looks away from him. And again, up above is a statue showing Cupid. This time, he's fallen asleep. His efforts having come to a good end, he's taking a bit of a breather. The last time, and I had met someone in Boston, who I was in love with. And <laughs> I went to him for a job interview. And um, I felt the job would involve a lot of statistical typing. And I felt I didn't want to do that. I had done that with the government and it was, no one else wanted to do it. But I met Russell Moore and it was wonderful. I didn't go to work for him, but he asked me to dinner that evening. And it was a wonderful friendship. Now, Russell was married, right? He was separated for five years. His wife was Catholic and wouldn't give him a divorce. So he was single. Yeah, she was so, living in Princeton, New Jersey. He mm. was uh, teaching at Boston University, and then he went into fundraising for Boston University. Mm. And uh, I loved him very much. And it never went away. When you truly feel that for someone, it remains with you. So it's possible to love more than one person, right? At the same time? Yeah. That... I don't know. Did you get love letters? Yes. Really? Do you keep this, them? I have. Really? Okay. And... Now, uh, now I'll tell you. Mm -hmm. That was number one. The one I was telling you about. My writes. very... Uh, ah! Yeah. He wrote... It, it was funny because we were in high school. I would find a, I would find a letter. He'd be in a, it would be in, in my locker, you know? I looked forward to it. Yeah, but he, he also broke my heart more than anybody. Mm -hmm. So there's that other aspect is that because he was a heartbreaker yeah. and he was the first or because he was such a great writer. Yeah, he did write lovely, long, 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 long letters mm -hmm. to me. Even though he could see you any day? Oh, yeah, he would leave me a letter. You know, it was sort of a standard. It was sort of a little a practice in high school yeah. that you wrote each other love letters during the day. Yeah. At least in our in the old days, now you text, so that would take that the whole thing out. Yeah. But there was something indelible, you know, that you could have and keep. And I kept them all in a box. I kept a lot of things that he gave me. I had this little box. I kept it all stored up, mm -hmm. and wrote them. And then, of course, you know, we were then we were together out of high school, and then he went to college, and I went to college, and then we would write each other all the time when we were in college. And I've got those saved. How about love letters? People write. I don't think they do anymore. That was, you know, essential in in Japan, as you know the, you know the tale of Genji and mm -hmm. the era. Mm -hmm. That have to be done by poems. Mm -hmm. So it's important to 
part of a courtship. Did you write love letters? Mm -hmm. You did. <laughs> I did. And um, I mean, how was it, was that for? I mean, would you write long love letters, short love letters, poetry? Long, of course. Long. Yeah. yeah pages, pages. Yeah. I when I was separated from my, you know, boyfriend Robert. Yes. Correct. <laughs> Your <laughs> husband. Yeah. I wrote the letter. He, he. Right, brought me back just like short <laughs> <laughs> one paragraph <laughs> if I ever <laughs> yeah. get the response. And so I still have that <laughs> because it's a, you keep he, that, yeah. he hardly write that. Mm, okay. that. <laughs> oh, but you kept them. Mm -hmm. yeah. Right. Yeah. Still have Did he keep yours? I don't know. <laughs> the male has as much to gain by producing children as the female does. Mm -hmm. But paternity and the lack thereof is the weak link in the genealogical scheme of things and not maternity. Maternity is always guaranteed. So the man has an interest in policing the woman? Precisely. Okay. Mate guarding behavior. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So the pattern of behavior would develop that would would uh, have opposing uh, kinds of play, where the woman would, I guess, be more reassuring about her fidelity than the man would be, or would make more show of fidelity. Would that Precisely. Be? Yeah. Yeah. Is that measurable? Do we have data on the display of fidelity by women, verbal or otherwise? Yes. Uh, on different levels, there's research that's been done on the behavior of relatives in the obstetrical wards of major metropolitan hospitals. So when the, the relatives of both the, the, the mother and the ostensible father mm. come in to see the baby, what happens more often than not is that the mother's relatives, and they do this not because they have any insight into what evolution is all about or, or competition for paternity is all about, but they nonetheless are far more likely to ascribe paternal rather than maternal features to the child. That child looks just like you. So the woman's family actually walks in and tries to reassure the pop father. Precisely. One of the things that's intrigued me over the years is how susceptible women are to a gift of flowers. Why is that? Why is that? That's a very good question. But aren't men susceptible to a gift of flowers? No. Not in the same way. No. I think that's a cultural thing. Mm. And it would be interesting to see if it's that way in Africa or um, Asia, among the Eskimos. They probably don't have too many flowers, so I don't know what they would do there. But, um, I mean, I, I love flowers. And... I've always liked flowers, and I, I plant, and I grow, and I have a garden, and uh, I don't know what that is. Something that has a, a life, something that's living. I don't know what it is about flowers. It's a thought, any gift can either express thoughtfulness or, or manipulation, so you can go in either direction with that, but authentic love, in my estimation, gives gifts because it's an expression of a sharing of love. It's a concretization, it's a symbolic uh, giving of oneself to the other person. Like, mm -hmm. even with Valentine's Day mm -hmm. or Christmas or any of those, it's mm -hmm. almost like, obviously something's expected of the other person to give gifts and stuff, but even on normal things, it's like, you can't just base your whole relationship on gifts and candy and jewels you can't do that. There needs to be something else. You have, mm -hmm. there, it's like grabbing sand. Friggin', you, you're left with nothing. 
Yeah, gift and on. Uh, so on if you really, mind. oh, he's such an asshole. Mm-hmm. Well, duh. I mean, come on, you know, because mm-hmm. he opened the door for you. That's it. And he's supposed to be a great mm-hmm. guy. And that's why all these, you know, guys out there and even ladies, at, at whoever, all they think is expected of them. Oh, let me do the door thing. Let me, you know, bring her flowers. Let me, you know, uh, pull out her chair and then I'll get her wherever I want her. And it's like, then after she thinks that there's a relationship going, there is no relationship going because it's not based on those things anymore. I have always been a feminist. And you know, even when it was unpopular to say I am a feminist, I would say I am a feminist. And so I tried to split, I, I, you know, when the guy would pay for something and I would pay for something and I was pretty careful about that. And I remember one time that only dated this, this guy very briefly and he was Russian and there was this, and he gave me a pair of gold earrings. And I remember sort of knowing that their relationship was not going to go that far and I was really sort of torn and I, um, I tried very hard to give the earrings back and then I ran into that. There's sort of a cultural thing of, you know, when you begin to feel that you're hurting someone's feelings by returning. So I did end up keeping the earrings and feeling ambivalent, you know, about, about that. And then the second weird thing he bought me was, which was really strange, he got it for my birthday and he buys me weird clothes, which I never really, he's learned that. I pick them out, and then he goes in and picks them out. But there was this thing, and it looked like a toucan. It looked like a bird. A toucan. It was a toucan bird. I don't know where. But it was one of these things where you, you, where I have it. You slid it on your shirt. Yes. <laughs> you know, you just you just gather your shirt up, and you would slide it. And you know, in the time, I guess during that period of time, it was like rings, but a, a fucking toucan. <laughs> I mean, I thought I had a little bit more style than that. Why do women like getting flowers so much? Hmm. One, one of the reason I get a lot of flowers from my husband is when he proposed me, I, I thought <laughs> I couldn't to say no to him, and I said, well, round the bush again, Japanese method. I want to marry somebody to give me fresh flowers every day, so I cannot marry you, <laughs> implying he's not capable <laughs> That's why. <laughs> okay. He's giving me a lot of fresh flowers. There's been some recent research that shows, and this is just fascinating, that males who spend all their money, rather than save some of their money, and males that spend more money than they make through the use of easily available credit have more sex partners than males that are more frugal. So by exaggerating their financial status, they can enhance their sexual prowess. And females have been selected to make choices among males in terms of their likelihood of being able to provision the female and her children. And in the modern environment, that takes the form of financial resources. So MasterCard has become the equivalent of Maybelline. It's a means of exaggerating your financial status, whereas Maybelline is a means of exaggerating your appearance and your apparent fertility. So when you went back to him, you were in love with him? No. No, I didn't want to marry him again. I knew that I would have to. Russ Moore couldn't get a divorce. We had looked at an apartment on Commonwealth Avenue together. 
but that would have meant he was we had no money between us I would have had to work full time my he didn't Russ didn't care for my parents and I understood why I really didn't care much for them than myself but they had a different background but my children had the benefit of living with my parents and they loved them and I felt I could not take them out of that environment, be in an apartment, have them with sitters, or I couldn't do it because of the children and because Jack was changing. He was calmer. He, he met the people. I worked with the, his last visit, and then when he called, a few days later and said that his brother had been to the doctors and he had, uh, you know, acute leukemia and uh, had three months to live. I said, I would, Jack, I'm returning. And he said, are you sure? I said, it's the only thing to do, the only thing. And I left Boston without calling Russ because um, I knew that it would break my heart. To but I did call him from the city, and he understood. We were both in tears, and um, we were in touch through the years. But, um, but I returned to Jack, and after a few weeks, I knew that it wouldn't last. How long did it last, Thelma? Oh, we were together six years. So it's quite a stretch. Yeah, yeah. but he... Um, yeah, and I used to tell him when the children are teenagers and I can go to work full time, then I would divorce him. What did he say? Good. <laughs> <laughs> Females, as I've already indicated, have something to gain if they're in a committed relationship by having children sired by mates other than their committed partner increased genetic variation among their offspring, and the opportunity to have children sired by males with better genes, okay? But the problem in that is if detection occurs, as we've already acknowledged, then she risks abandonment, maybe even being killed, having her children killed, and so on and so forth. So the name of the game becomes one of minimizing detection. When was the last time you were walking down the street and you ever witnessed an instance of public copulation? Yeah, it's it doesn't happen. Yeah. Humans are concealed copulators. Humans sequester themselves carefully for purposes of having sex. And I take that as evidence that extra pair copulations or infidelity was an embedded feature of human evolutionary history. After an instance of female infidelity, you would expect the female to become reluctant to have sex with her committed partner. Why? Because if she has sex with her committed partner shortly after having sex with a rival male, then that, that could create sperm competition, semen displacement could happen, and it, would, it might function to minimize the likelihood of conceiving as a consequence of having sex with a rival male. So you would expect females to become reluctant to have sex. You would expect males, if there's even the slightest indication that there may have been an instance of infidelity, to become insistent about having sex with their committed partner so as to create sperm competition and semen displacement and increase the likelihood of paternity on their part. Females, however, after several days that a model we've developed would predict, should now show a return to pre-infidelity baseline and overshoot and become insistent about having sex with their committed partners. To what, to reassure them, to... Precisely. And if they have been impregnated, it becomes 
very important to have sex with their committed partner so as to cover their tracks gotcha. and maximize the impression of paternity. Now, many females, under the cloak of anonymity, admit that instances of infidelity enhance their feelings of love and attachment for their committed partners. And this would function to promote the appearance of father. Yeah. I just, I want to just be the best lady for him so that he doesn't have to, you know, go somewhere else. Because I, I will just say that, you know, I don't think anybody could love him the way that I love him. Well, Walter was Jack's friend. He lived down the hall. Mm. And Jack, we would complain to Walter that um, he would say that my wife wants to divorce me. I'm waiting for an apartment in the building on the first floor. And mm. Jack was very charming. And people were very protective of him. But he knew that he knew exactly what was happening, and I knew too. But so long as we spoke, it wasn't a surprise. But Walter's wife died, so he was home, and he would come down the hall and listen to Jack's music. And he would start to talk to me about marriage and how important it was to keep a marriage together and what I would be missing. And I told him to, it was none of his business. So long as Jack and I knew, he says, but Jack doesn't want this divorce. And I said, well, it has to be. It's not getting any better and it's difficult. So um, I, introduced Walter to a friend of mine. I felt that he and my friend Fran would get along very well. And she had the same name as his deceased wife. So she lived down the street and I had said to Jack, why don't we, why don't you ask Walter to go for a walk with you? and?" We'll go over to Franz. And he said, told me not to get involved. Walter was living with his mother-in-law, who was another story, but um, who was in love with him. So, and she wanted to be the head of, with the head of the household. I'm sure she would have been. But anyhow, I went with Walter to Franz to introduce him to her. And uh, she had com some company from out of town, and we had a terrific evening. And we talked. It was about a 10-minute walk to Fran's place. And she invited him to come again in a, f a few days later. And um, he asked me to go along, too. She was having other people, so it was all right, and I did. And that's how Walter and I got to know each other. I don't understand that um, American people who could get, who, who divorce each other and marry and then three, four times. I, I just don't understand. Once was enough, <laughs> and if it didn't work out. My mother had said to me that every relationship is sort of a reaction to the relationship that comes before it. So people tend to. You know, if you're in an incredibly symbiotic relationship, the next one will usually have more air in it. And if the next relationship feels like there's so much air that you're not communicating, then the next one will be, um, which probably explains why people have these serial relationships. But I also think that if you're with the same person long enough, you actually have a lot of different marriages. And they each last for two years or three years or however long. And then, you know, it, if you're going to last, you probably need to renegotiate. 
and it's like, <laughs> uh, did we have it this month? I, don't, I can't remember. Oh, yeah. And, uh, you know, that kind of thing. And, you know, there's part of you that says, boy, I wish I had that thing. That you really wanted that. Yeah. Yeah, you sort of want to rekindle that, but you don't, you know, it's yeah. like, God, you know. Well, it's dangerous territory for people in middle life. You know, it, it is. Well, it's dangerous to have it all. Just maybe once in a while to have that sort of, yeah. that kind of, uh, that yeah. kind of sex or that kind of lust going on. It's different. It, 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 it's different. I mean, I think there's some people that do. I mean, I think there's some people that that, that might throw a whole marriage that, oh. do that, you know, if you watch Oprah and and Dr. Phil and everybody else, mm -hmm. they're saying, you know, you should be having regular, you should be having a lot of sex. We've collected evidence to show that females that have unprotected sex that are being inseminated, sexually active females, on a, on a regular basis are less depressed as measured by objective measures such as the Beck Depression Inventory than females that are having protected sex using condoms. And the magnitude of this effect varies from one female to the other. We've, we, we've received what I call semen testimonials from females who have switched from condoms to unprotected sex and have noticed, in some instances, a dramatic change. You know, if, if you were a fly on the wall mm -hmm. or whatever outside of my office listening in, mm -hmm. you would hear a lot of laughter okay. here because I think um, being even that aspect of that um, dimension of jealousy, uh, very serious. However, if you, if I or somebody can help us take each other lightly, yes, there are serious issues but sometimes they get too serious and then we don't really have the broader vision because we're so zeroed in on, ooh, this is very serious. Mm -hmm. Yes, serious, but look at the broader vision and humor will often cut through that and break open a very hard and rigid way of perceiving. Yeah. It'll give us a totally other perspective. Yeah. You laugh a lot. Yeah. He is funny too. Oh, Bonnie is <laughs> funny guy. Yeah. So I, when I ask my daughter when she is going out with somebody, is he funny? <laughs> <laughs> I always ask. This is a card mm -hmm. see, from my loving wife mm -hmm. on your birthday. Mm -hmm. A loving wife is a gift from God. Okay, so you know. Are you ready? Are you gotten it already? Mm -hmm. You know? And you know, then he says, to my dearest wife, you know, uh, the day that you were born, I'm sure that God already knew that one day we would meet and I would fall in love with you. For I have seen his blessings and I have felt his guiding hand leading me to share my life exactly as he had planned. People actually write this shit to each other. Um, plan. With a woman who had shown me just how loving God can be, my wife, my friend, my soulmate, who means the world to me. And then he, I love this. Thank you again, God. <laughs> <laughs> Happy birthday with love, Monty. That one, I, that one got me. Thank you again, God. That's good. what a character. <laughs> it kills me. Yeah, no. That one funny. just, but that 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 means more to me than all the bullshit in this card. <laughs> Are you getting it? If so, well, I mean, this just complete. doesn't mean yeah. a thing. But yeah. the way the way he he can get me with that line yeah, is funny. is what what makes me crazy about him. I'm so glad, like I could still make you laugh after all this time, and that yeah. you know, I mean, even though a year, like it just seems like you know, that's pretty, that's nothing. But in in now relationship yeah. terms, yeah. it's actually you know good yeah. time running because. Yeah. These days, I think, you know, as far as romances, you know, everybody's everywhere, you know, it's, it's, I, I just don't feel like 
it's taken seriously as as back then. And it's more again the media and the movies and the and the this and the that and people like Jersey Shore, if you've ever seen that show, or Real World or all some those MTV that, it's some. like mm. that isn't love. That isn't love for you and you need to just get yourself away from that that's very small space because it, it just seems like the romance, people forget about that. They forget about the passion that a relationship takes and they kind of just go with it like it's gonna actually last and you're like, are you jo joking me? You m met some guy at some club and there's no dancing anymore. Have you noticed that? There's no dancing anymore. You got sixth graders wearing thongs. You got those brat dolls that have no clothes on and no noses and everybody's on something, <laughs> on something, okay? Prescription drugs out of the cabinet. Hookers and, and pimps are like in sixth grade now. And it's like, what are you doing? Children, I don't know what they're doing, but the generations that are coming up, there's no damn romance. So you were very happy with Walter for many very years. Very happy. Yes. And um, that was what? 25 years. It's quite a long time. And, and it was and it was easy. Yeah. Difficulties at first because of his son and the mother in law mm. and the family business. But we mm. got over that and we both were mm. Walter had no money. His mother in law had taken whatever money was left. He sold his business and she was his bookkeeper and the money was gone. But that was it didn't matter to him. He felt he had always earned, he had good money, and I felt I could always work. And Jack loved his children. He would do whatever he could. He was doing better at the time. He liked. Jack was calming down. When he met Vi, he really began to enjoy things more. The capacity for deception, I, th I think. The, the evolutionary roots that underpin mm. the capacity for, set, for deception are very, very interesting. Mm. It, there are basically two kinds of deceptions. There's hardwired deception, and then, in, in, then deception that has a conscious, intentional component. Mm. Examples of hardwired deception would be things like injury feigning on the part of ground nesting birds. So mm. if they have a nest with with chicks or eggs in it, mm. if a if a predator approaches, they'll leave the nest mm. and engage in injury feigning, drag a wing so as to distract mm. the predator from that nest. Mm. I don't think that has an intentional component. I think that's an instinctive hardwired mm. reaction. Yep. Yep. The capacity for intentional and therefore much more detailed and situation specific kinds of deception mm. requires the ability to take into account what other people want, know, or intend to do. It's what's mm. called theory of mind. Mm. And if you're in the position to be able to correctly gauge and and anticipate how somebody's going to react mm -hmm. to either misinformation or withholding information, mm -hmm. the likelihood of being able to effectively perpetrate an instance of successful deception is enhanced. So you need a pretty high-grade creature to engage in this stuff. I mean, basically, you need a, a human being. And that may be the cutting edge of the selective pressure, in part, that gave rise to bigger and bigger human brains. Well, Competition in the social arena, mm. which put a premium on being able to take into account what other people want, know, or intend to do, and how other people are going to react to misinformation or denials or the withholding of information. And after Walter died, there's a hiatus. I met Jerry three years later. Yes. I went to work in Monty's office. And that too was a friendship. 
and which is what it is. It's a good friendship, and it's what you more understand. I'm, I am more understanding of certain things. And I'm glad, I'm grateful that I don't say what I want to say sometimes. And then it passes, and I'm so pleased that I didn't say anything. Because you don't want to hurt the person you're with in any way. Jack would hurt me deliberately, but then he'd be sorry because he would just do it, say it to hurt, to hurt me. Mm. And uh, he was always disappointed that I didn't finish college. <laughs> I love thee, I love but thee with a love that shall not die till the sun grows cold and the stars grow old. Well, I think love is a very, very, very powerful thing. I believe that it, sh it should be eternal because mm. if you want it to be real mm. and it's there mm. and it's not fabricated with all these nonsense things and bickering in your ear, um, I believe that it can do just that because we're, we're all spirits. I became very aware of Jack with respect after his death, mm. from going through the things, from seeing, going through the apartment, from going through all the photos, mm. from talking to Melanie. And it's a feeling of gratitude. I feel, well, you know what my belief is, John, you know, that love continues. Mm. and. Uh, connection is never severed. Well, maybe somebody uh, you might be interested in or admire, but love is totally different from like more emotional commitment, not intellectual. So you, I believe that will last forever. I think that we, whether or not they're ghosts, I think we continue to have relationships with the people we've loved who are dead. And we have the relationship with them. Perhaps if there are ghosts, then they have the relationship with us as well. But that relationship does change. As your perceptions change, as your, it's dynamic. And um, so I think there may be something that exists. Because I think it's not just a connection of body to body but it's a connection of spirit to spirit, or soul to soul, and um, my belief is that there is something that continues after death. Spirit, soul, and that there is a bond, and you're right, you know, we don't think of other things continuing, enduring forever, eternally, um, but I certainly believe that about love. I think most of human behavior is driven by unconscious kinds of processes, yeah. hardwired, evolved, yeah. genetically driven kinds yeah. of processes. Now this is interesting, John. This was, mm -hmm. I guess, Jack's mug, mm -hmm. and I had my coffee, mm -hmm. and this was left oh, inside the mug. That's spectacular. So this is a little hot. That's... Yeah. I... So you drank from Jack's mug. Yeah and the stain formed into a heart. And I never washed it after that. I couldn't. Well, Paris seems a good place to wind this up, the city of light and the city of love. Here on the Pont des Arts, people pursue a modern ritual of love. They hang padlocks on the railings with their names on them, in the hopes, I suppose, that their love will also last forever. We wish them well. What have we learned on our excursion through the world of love? 
Well, it seems that romantic love is a function of the deep sexual arrangements that have built up during evolution. But it also seems that it's overlaid by culture, personality, and circumstance, so that a huge range of behaviors becomes expressed through love. We've seen that love is probably, as they say, bigger than all of us, and that almost anything that everybody says about love might very well be true. We've also learned that love can be destructive, that it can exact a terrible price on some people. And we've also learned that Shakespeare had a great deal to say about love. Love is a familiar, says a character in Love's Labour's Lost. By familiar, he doesn't mean an everyday occurrence. He means a spirit, a guiding and perhaps unreliable spirit. So the quote goes, Love is a familiar. Love is a devil. There is no evil angel but love. The last panel shows the young couple happily together. Here they are more static than in the other panels, the young man with his head on the young lady's shoulder as they read through their love letters and think about the excitement of their romance. Up above there is calm too. The Venus is now clothed and walks demurely, but the Cupid is still pestering her. No doubt there are many follies yet to come. <laughs>